El Salvador figured out that if you invite liquidity in, they can benefit from that liquidity. Okay, and they're not talking about dollar liquidity, they're talking about Bitcoin liquidity. And that's the, the, the categorical difference between other countries and the countries that are freaking out like the Netherlands. Go ahead and freak out, okay? Because we figured out the game and the game is up, okay? There's no more game. If we denominate our value and trade in Bitcoin, there's nothing you can do. Welcome back to the Kevin Devani Connection Show. Instead of fighting, you know, the central banks, the IMF, the European Central Bank, the Bank for International Settlements, and all the other, you know, governmental central banking uh, institutions and structures, uh, which have nothing, you know, than hate and, 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 and oppression and violence, aggression, coercion uh, uh, in their monopolistic uh, power structures and you know systemic theft is going on so what if we uh you know create our our own structures our own uh systems uh, that is bitcoin that can only be bitcoin because it's the only thing that is decentralized that is totally immutable that is absolutely scarce that is censorship resistant unconfiscatable and we can create new economies new deflationary economies and make you know all these uh, dinosaur structures totally obsolete so this is why i want to talk to dan sanchez uh, whom i've really started respecting since today because i found him today I, he wasn't on my radar till recently so without further ado this is my talk with dan sanchez on volcano bonds denominated in bitcoin that's the title of the episode but we're going to go much much deeper because um, he's written a thread a twitter thread uh, which you should you know read for yourself and in essence you know he's uh, proposing you know to create uh, uh, an offering based on the expected rate or return that el salvador, el salvador for example can yield from bitcoin mining using the volcanic generated geothermal geothermal energy through steam and whether it can be done or not, we don't know, you know, uh, not with certainty, but, uh, you know, there's a high chance that we can, you know, make ourselves totally independent from these, uh, from the fiat centralized structures and, uh, you know, and accelerate the process of hyper Bitcoinization, deflation in economies, prosperity, abundance. So this is my talk with Dan Sanchez. Hope you're going to enjoy this. Last. So Dan Sanchez, thank you so much for your time spontaneously, uh, you know, for coming to my show. You've written, you know, some awesome content, some, you know, beautiful Twitter thread on uh, well, what, what to call it, on the thesis of volcano bonds denominated in Bitcoin. Yeah, so yeah. can you maybe do a breakdown for some, for some folks, you know, who have, you know, who have never dealt, you know, with these kind of, con you know, issues or topics? What is... Like, what is the fundamental problem here with uh, negative ne negative yielding bonds? Uh, you know, you mixed in, you know, the CPI, the you know, the the, fo the fully deceptive CPI. Yeah. What, what's the connection there? There, there's a core disconnection between what people understand about uh, general finance that that really I try to address with simple language, and it all starts with how money managers, corporations, and other people that are qualified to get money directly from the central banks uh, don't really understand. So th the central banks give or have get, been giving people uh, money at 0% for, for over a decade. And this, this allows them to have an advantage over anyone else borrowing money so when I say 0%, I mean literally 0%. Uh, it's been a decade of 0% interest in the US. The Federal, uh, Federal Reserve has capped the rate at 0% since Obama left the office, or since Obama started in office really in 2008, when he got elected, um, the great crash happened. And that's really what triggered this, this fiscal disaster because everyone's over leveraged. Everyone owes more than they can pay. So they just have to keep borrowing to keep the can, you know, rolling down the street if you will and that's what i address is is the core issue of of how people earn money in this scheme uh the scheme is always derived from having to leverage up instead of consuming less and by by that i mean 
you have to utilize the tools that the bank gives you in order to borrow money. And that's only accessible to people that are qualified. Like I said, uh, my, my main issue with the banking system now is that it relies solely on debt. The dollar itself is monetized as debt. So even if you earn a hundred dollars, that money is going to cost you debt to carry by a simple decree of the central bank. So they can print as much money as they want, but they have to monetize that with debt. And that's what the source of everything comes. Um, everything starts with the debt, with the money. So if you fix the money, fix the world, that's the whole, the motto of Bitcoin. And if we, if we apply that to bonds, which is the, one of the biggest uh, categories of assets that people buy, especially uh, money managers, banks, and everyone else that's involved in finance, they all use bonds as a vehicle of value to trade amongst each other so that they can make a profit. Um, and let me know if I'm speaking too fast, but my heart is racing right now. I just, I love this topic and I want to convey the value of understanding this first, because if we don't understand what's subjecting us to this misery of fiat, we can't really move ahead. Okay. You can have Bitcoin and understand what it means to have sound money. But if you don't know what's ailing you, what sickness you have, then you can't fix it. And that's really what, what I want to bring about with this thread that I wrote about Bitcoin bonds and volcano bonds. Because Max Kaiser is brilliant. He's, he's taught me over the past decade what really ails us. And he's explained it so well. Um, it, it, it really begins with that. So Max Kaiser and Stacy, thank you so much for, for, for being a part of this community. And yeah, big shout out to them. I mean, I've really I've yeah. followed them like for such a long time. And I wish I would have listened to, you know, Max Kaiser. When was it? Like 2000? I don't know when, you know, it's like so many years ago. I, I even remember yeah. when Alex Jones show, you know, it's like buy Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. But, you know, ne nobody like, you know, explained to me what are the fundamental issues here? What is hard yeah. money? What is what is scarcity? I didn't even know that Bitcoin has absolute scarcity until, you know, a few years ago, you know? Yeah, and, and that, that's the the the. the issue here to, uh, we're trying to address is deleting the ability of certain individuals, whatever their names are, whatever institutions they represent, deleting that, that ability for them to print money out of our pockets. Because you earned $100 yesterday. Tomorrow, it might not be worth $100 worth of purchasing power. And that's where the scheme begins. Okay, that's just the very tippity top of the mountain of scams. And I'm sorry if I use a curse word, for those that are sensitive, because I, I am, I'm extremely uh, animated sometimes with my hands yeah. and Spanish, you know, so I, I try to be exploitive with my words or try not to be exploitive with my words, but with my hands. So um, the bond system utilizes the central banking system to take money out. Okay, that's really all you have to do. So if you buy a house, that's $100,000 and your, 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 your yearly interest a mortis, amortized interest is let's say six percent, whatever. They'll take that. They'll take that paper that promises you're going to pay six percent every year for the first fifteen years, and then you're going to pay down your, your your mortgage, quote unquote, right? What you what you actually borrowed for the house. And they'll take that note and they'll convert it and stuff it into a bunch of different ones, okay, to make a make a product. And that's really where the 2008 crisis started to unveil because people couldn't pay, pay their mortgage. So those products started uh, devaluing too quickly for them to dump it. And so everyone dumped and that's what caused the great recession of 2008. So now we have a cumulative amount of mortgages, cumulative amount of debt and cumulative amount of assets that are being borrowed against at rates that are way below what the central banks are giving people to, to use the money for. And they're taking that product, that profit out, I'm sorry, the profit out immediately. So you can buy a 10 year bond, which is at what one something right now. And <laughs> you can sell it over and over and over amongst a bunch of group of people mm -hmm. just getting yield out. Okay, just getting your profit out. Because you say, look, it's gonna go up, it's gonna go down. So they just trade that paper over and over and over. It's a giant scheme. So that's of, the rehypothecation that Katen Long always talks about, is that it? Correct, okay. it, it, it is. but. It, but it really goes a step above that because the, uh, the European Central Bank has negative yield uh, money. So their, their negative yield rates are 0.04%, I believe, or 0.05%. And that allows there to be a yield 
in a negative sense. So the bonds can go up to 0.02%. And the difference between those two yields is what people make money on. It's absolute lunacy. So how do we defeat that? And that's what I wanted to focus on, not really complaining about what the system does or whatever the case. I'm done with complaining. I'm done with you know bickering about the system is broken, blah, blah, blah. We got to act on it now. So the way to do that is to create a product denominated fully in Bitcoin so that we don't talk about fiat anymore. We're not subject to the rules of fiat anymore. We're not going to wait until they give us approval to issue a bond. We're not going to say, hey, can we issue a bond in dollars? No, no, no. We're done. It's over. Yeah. Maybe I'm uh, okay. jumping a little bit too fast, Dan, but yeah. let me just ask you, because this is uh, a question that's pre preoccupying my mind, because I think it's a very critical time. And that, the, the question I posed you know, to a lot of even Kate Long or other people you know, in, in this community is, is I asked, you know, what kind of so-called, you know, extortative leverage do these central banking institutions that IMF have against, for example, El Salvador and all these other exploited uh, South American countries? You know, it's been going on for not only, you know, South America, it's like, you know, this exploitation has been going on for, you know, this uh, militarized, exploitative, uh, you know, uh, yeah. uh, uh, I mean, is there like would it facilitate the process if if a critical number of countries such as whatever Nicaragua or Ecuador all these other countries would collectively like you know more or less do this in synchronicity it, it depends because if they're using the money productively like i expect El Salvador to do with geothermal mining pardon with geothermal mining of bitcoin and using that to grow their economy with actual ROI, not just paper ROI, then yes. But you have to find that, that specific yield based on pure return. You're not talking about, hey, we're gonna build a bridge for what purpose, right? Is there gonna be an economic reality where that bridge yields a profit for the company or rather for the country? So that's the differentiation between fiat and Bitcoin. Bitcoin, we need real yields. We can't just make stuff up and say, hey, we're going to get 7% on how, how, who, what exactly is be done to get the yield. Because most of the time people don't ask that. It's, they just see a realized yield, expected yield, and they're saying, okay, that's fine. We're going to try to do this over, the, over 20 years. But there's no actuality there. So I believe, yes, there's a service there to, to, to decommercialize the need for developing countries and the connection with the IMF is not economic. It is not economic. It is political, okay? That is the difference between my understanding and, and some, maybe somebody else's that, that derives the value of the IMF existing at all as an economic value because they, 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 pose, they pose themselves as, as helping, as we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna unimpoverish people. But we all know that capitalism as a laissez-faire system does that organically. So why do they exist? And it is because it is a political tool that the IMF uses to pay off corrupt people in each country, okay? And I'm not going to mention any countries at all because I don't want to be a part of these countries. But there are countries that are simply paid off by the IMF in a political sense. So they say, hey, we're going to borrow $600 million for COVID relief. But what amount of that did it, did it actually reach the individuals that need it? It's maybe one percent maybe zero one percent maybe nothing right so that's what i focus on is is this demolishing that idea that imf is an economic savior it is not it is a political tool that is used to distribute dollars on an international basis so that people can control each country as they see fit and it's not about keeping people poor it's about subjugation okay subjugation economics subjugation, subjugation of economies because if, if, for example, Guatemala is an incredible productive country, it's likely the most productive country in Central America, they don't want you to have a higher GDP every year in comparison to the dollar because they have a, a, a basis of, of comparison when you see a, a, hear a trade deficit, right? You hear a trade deficit being bad, right? Because the dollar has a, a monopoly on that exchange rate and they, have to, they get to dictate what rates you get in exchange for the dollar. So in Guatemala, there's the Quetzal. The Quetzal is 7.5676. For example, we get seven Quetzals for $1 here. And what does that do? That means that people on the inverse relationship to the dollar have to work seven times longer for the same dollar. Okay, so we get, we get pegged. 
by the dollar on a, on an individual basis because we can't negotiate our labor because the labor that we sell is pegged to the to the profitability of the companies that we work for and the companies that we work for have to expect a certain amount of dollars in return for their products so it, it's all inverse to how it's supposed to work it's a controlled economy based on the dollar period there's absolutely no there's no difference between what, what you would do in a communist country versus what the dollar does and i'm sorry to say that but it is the truth yeah and th that's excellent uh dan so um you know there was uh, allegedly there was this meeting between the imf and uh, you know naib bukele the, the president of el salvador no. i mean we don't know you know what came out of this so we'll, we might you know find out hopefully soon um what do you think i mean is the um, what, what do you think, do they have some kind of, you know, inherently, I, I'm, for principal reasons, I don't have any trust in politicians or political leaders, you know, or political institutions. Rightfully so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but so. I mean, how do you think this is going to play along? I mean, do you, do you think they might have some kind of leverage and they could theoretically, you know, pull back, you know, this whole bill that they have enacted? I mean... <laughs> uh, well, here, here's where I think we come in as plebs. I'm not rich, okay? I, I don't have thousands of Bitcoin, okay? But the point is that we, we can issue Bitcoin bonds simply by issuing them electronically and having there, there be a, a record, and a public record of who owns what and who bought what. And the IMF could definitely just pull the plug. And that, that, was, that would affect a lot of people, including the people that are keeping control of the pol political segments of the country. I don't know the politics of El Salvador very well. And I'll be honest, I'm not standing up for one president or the other. So th let that be clear. I'm not saying that El Salvador is, is guiltless of whatever they're, you know, they're, they're, they're allegedly doing or not doing. I'm focused on the economics and the control that that implies by the IMF. So yes, they could, they could, they could plug, they could unplug the aid and whatever results that happens, you know, they'll say, oh, well, sayonara, El Salvador could be leveraged heavily to kill the Bitcoin lay, la lay Bitcoin for, for, for obvious reasons, right? Because they stand to lose more immediately. So it all comes down to extending or lowering our time preference. And I, I've learned that from several people in the Bitcoin community that's repeated over and over and over. Let's apply that here. How can we lower the time preference of a country? How can we lower the time preference of a world that is over leverage and extreme high time preference on every day. Okay, there, there's no country in the world that doesn't have high time preference. So by denominating a bond in Bitcoin, we can collectively use the power, the purchasing power of Bitcoin and the system that it relies upon to der derive value by, by mining to increase our leverage as individuals. And it is an absurd idea to even suggest that collectivism is good for Bitcoin but it isn't collectivism if you're voluntarily helping a cause that is up to you to decide and up to you to, de to determine whether it's beneficial to you because we're not collective individuals. We're individuals that are relying upon our own means to deliver the value that we need to survive. So what are my messages is always lower your time preference. How can we do that with a country? And this is how I see it. The IMF has no control over interest rates. The, the central banks do. So by forcing a Bitcoin bond, the denominated in Bitcoin, we remove the need to request permission to issue a bond. Because, yes, yeah, somebody said, let's do it, do it in fiat like Michael Saylor is doing. Pardon. But that requires permission. That requires access to the markets that, that require permission. Okay, I'm not a qualified investor. I'll never be a qualified investor. And I know a million people on Twitter and elsewhere are not going to be qualified investors. So... The only issue here is, yes, they could blow us all up immediately by raising rates, okay? They could end the party today. Just raise rates 1% and you'll see what happens because a hint of, of a quarter point percentage in the US market would implode the stock market, okay? It would decimate everyone with a fixed income. It would clear out 401ks, IRAs, and everyone with a pension. Okay, wouldn't that, uh, like, wouldn't uh, Dan? Wouldn't that unwind what what all you know? Many others also, like you know Jeff Booth, whom I really respect. He said, you know, it would. It, I mean, the unwinding of this debt spiral would 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 cause so much havoc and and chaos and social disruption mm -hmm. and and what have you. I mean, 
uh, the implications and consequences are just unimaginable, I think, you know, w once I, it unwinds. You can't measure, you can't measure this, the, uh, the scope of damage that that would cause. But that's my point. At, what, at which point do we decide there's got to be a limit to this, okay? Because they'll keep the party going. They're not going to stop, okay? They're going to print $6 trillion right now, and that they're going to tax people 90% in the U.S., and they're going to tax the world 15% just to pay for it. Okay, that's the cost of us losing our individual sovereignty to produce and to keep our own value. So at which point do we say, look, we have an alternative, we have an exit. What is it gonna cost the world? What is it gonna cost individuals if we continue this charade of value? And I think the cost of maintaining the system is much higher because it benefits so many, so few people. Okay, the, the top 1% is $30 trillion richer. As opposed to, for example, someone working at a car dealership fixing cars, they have a fixed income and they're seeing that income diminish because of inflation. So it might be a, a stab wound or a slash, right? The difference between taking your arm off and taking your whole torso off, really, do we want to be in control of that bloodletting or do we want to see the banks just decide on their own what they want to do with us? Because that's really what it comes down to is what, what are we deciding to do? as individuals. So everybody that's, that's in Bitcoin is taking action to exit the dollar, okay? Hold is not about making more money. It's not about making more dollars. And everybody understands that, okay? Those are people that exited because Ellen tweeted are not in hold mode, okay? They're not interested in devalue or de denominating their trade in Bitcoin in the future. They're not interested in, in, in having a trade where there's a fair system of, of exchange and a value value maintaining currency like Bitcoin. Okay, they want to see more dollars in their bank account. And that's not what I want. I know a lot of people that don't want that. So it, it, the, the price discovery of, of what trade needs to be is unknown. And that's really what I've been building on for the past few months uh, with, a, with a company. I'll, I'll try not to plug it, but if anyone's interested, you can just go to my profile at Dan Sanchez and look at it. It's an auction house that, that really runs on FOMO for digital assets. And the point is to discover what people are truly willing to pay for in Bitcoin, not in dollars, not in euros, not in yen, but in Bitcoin. What are people willing to pay for something that they consider value according to how much Bitcoin they themselves have or they themselves can earn? And that is where we're going to deviate from this charade of value. Where, and that's why, that's why I'm advocating for a complete denomination of Bitcoin, a complete denomination away from fiat. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of you know, rambling. Yeah, on. Dan, you know, no, you're, 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 no, you're, you're spot on. You're spot on. You know, um, I have such high hopes for for the case for this prime, uh, you know, case of, of El Salvador, once they start, because, you know, it's going to be sort of mandatory, you know, to display them the, the prices in as, as far as I'm informed, you know, in Bitcoin and US dollar, right? Is that correct? So no, it's a, it's a, it's an op, uh, optional denomination. No, but I mean it's the not, display not, of the prices amazing. can be in Bitcoin and U.S. dollar. Is oh, that is that yeah, how it's yeah. going to work? Yeah. So so they're going to you know instigate and into you know in, and to accelerate this this um, what do you call it circular economy, local economy within this country. So if that like spills over to all the other uh, let's say South American countries. Uh, you know, and they, you know, uh, they do the same playbook, you know, they do, you know, they put it on the reserves, they, you know, sort of more or less the same playbook like El Salvador, couldn't let, couldn't that, you know, this, couldn't that scenario like catapult <laughs> the hyper Bitcoinization into just another level? And then we finally, you know, can yeah. change our mindset into purchasing power. The unit of account changes in your mind. And once that changes, the fiat denominated, you know, this pricing, you know, the, all this FUD and this FOMO and this whatever is going on, you know. It won't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter because it's about no. purchasing power. The true yeah. exponential purchasing power. Yeah, it's maintaining that purchasing power. I think I think if we if we can if we can deploy a voluntary bond issuing uh, issuance denominated in bitcoin it would it would open the, the pardon it would open the eyes of many people who consider themselves dependent on the imf and other central banks for them to be given the liquidity that they want because this is all about liquidity okay we want to get stuff done we don't want to talk about you know the yields and the, and the bond market and all that it, it it's all fixed 
to keep people underneath the rich people poor. Okay, that's that's the basis of understanding that I have. By doing this, we could very well trigger a complete and utter destruction of the fiat market. I don't know. I don't understand. And I don't really believe in the macroeconomics that are giving to us by the government. Okay. I, I don't believe I, I'm an Austrian and I, I read the macros. I understand the macros, but do I, do I simply accept them? No, because there is no way to measure individual economic output on dollars. No way. Okay, there's simply no way to measure individuals' ability to add value, except in an individual transaction, an individual basis. So I, I try to look at every individual that comes across my page or on my Twitter as, hey, what are you doing to add value? And how does that represent in your fiat or in your Bitcoin denomination? Because like, it is broken. There's no way to define that other than saying, we're going to issue a bond. Okay, it's not, not permissioned. I'm sorry to say. But if you want to be a part of it, you can, and it's it's not going to be a fiat yield. It's going to be a Bitcoin yield. We're going to figure out a way to do that so that it is pegged to a fiat, a, pardon, a, a Bitcoin yield, and we'll see what happens. I don't know if El Salvador is going to take it or not. I don't know if we're going to be able to get 100 people on this, but BitcoinBond.com is live. It's got a simple site that I built myself using WordPress templates. I mean, it's nothing complicated. I'm not a developer. So it really relies on individuals to, to decide whether this is worth it or not. I don't know what the infrastructure, infrastructure is going to look like, but I know that next week I'm personally going to the first free trade zone in Guatemala to establish whether or not we can build a mine there and pivot away from the manufacturing base that they were expecting to have based on the U.S. demand of products. Okay, Because that demand of products is not going to be the same today. It's not going to be the same next year. And it's definitely not going to be the same next 10 years. because of the debasement of the currency that the, the Americans rely on is simply unavoidable. Okay, the, ba the, the debasement is not going to it's not going to be it's not going to be the same. Uh, the world's not going to be the same ever again. Okay, after this debasement, so I'm building for the future. I'm preparing here, in Guatemala. I think we have a, a a a basin of opportunity that we can all the whole world can take advantage of by simply. Uh, you know, visiting. If you want to visit, uh, it's not a, it's not a. You know, it doesn't look like like Miami, and it doesn't look like Jupiter, Florida, but it's a beautiful country. It's a natural country. People are kind. People are just. Okay, they're not going to try to scam you. And what I want to communicate mostly is, you know, Latin America has been subjugated by this more than most other countries and more most other regions. And I'm not going to uh, discount that subjugation in other countries at all. But immigrants go here. Or, well, immigrants come to the United States to earn dollars to, to avoid this, this whole dilemma, right? And I pointed that out yesterday on Twitter. The, the irony in this is so huge, okay? It's so huge that it, it, really, it brought me to tears yesterday because it is, not, it is not justice for people to have to leave their homes to go to work somewhere else that they don't want to go, okay? People in Guatemala don't want to go to the U.S. Or maybe some do. Okay, but I came back to Guatemala for the very reason that I had to leave. Okay, I could not stand the U.S. anymore as a as a general place. I'm not discounting the people there. I'm not saying that it's a horrible place, but personally for me, it is not somewhere I wanted to raise my family. So I decided to come back. And I know a lot of people that are living in the, in the U.S. that want to come back to Guatemala because this country is extremely focused on liberty. It is extremely focused on family. And the same as in El Salvador, El Salvadorians are family first. My neighbors are actually uh, a lot from El Salvador. One of my best friends is from El Salvador and he lives right next door. Um, and he talks to me about the family that he misses, right? So it's it's a prevalent message that, that immigrants in the US don't want to be in the US, okay? They have to be there because of economic reasons. So if we can say, look, there's more opportunity here than there is now, than there is in the US now. Come home, work here. We need to, qualified individuals because the principles that are U.S. based are liberty, freedom, the, the liberty to pursue happiness, right? And, and, to, and to be justice in, in the law. Uh, but I discern, discernment is, is, is really individual, right? So it depends on the individuals, if they want to absorb that or not. But me personally, I took that away, you know, the, the, the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, and everything that matters in the U.S. is... Currently, what matters in Latin America more than anywhere, okay? 
And I know there's patriots in the U.S. that agree with me and see the, the progress in Latin America. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I won't get any more political than that. I think there's a huge awakening taking place because, you know, of this uh, accelerated, you know, rate of speed in, in the communication, you know, in uh, in the Internet. I mean, what would we do with without? I mean, just look at what Nick Carter initiated this, this you know, Twitter spaces, and it was like live, a live, you know, discussion and, and, and explanation, you know, how the bill, you know, was introduced and, 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 and uh, you know, enacted and, uh, and then eventually signed by, by the president. I mean, this has never been done before. And we are, I think we're such on a, such a, such a tipping point of humanity or human history and, and monetary evolution. I think it's unimaginable. What, let me first ask you: Like, do you see, do you see hyperinflation coming? Uh, explain hyperinflation. Hyperinflation. See, in, are you well, able to pay for the in the eurozone well, or my, you know, I, and the dollar? Uh, well, it depends on, uh, and I'll go back to Michael Saylor. Okay, he explained it perfectly. What is your basket of goods? Okay, are you buying houses? Yes. Are you buying cars? Yes. Are you buying food? Slowly, yeah, it's, it's trickling up. But the realized inflation isn't happening in the US yet or in the Eurozone yet because most of the products that are landing there are from here, from other countries that are producing goods, okay? They're manufacturing goods. And they're seeing the inflation go up higher at a higher rate here than they are in the US. So by, by, by default, for example, the person I buy eggs from has a small farm of about 95 chickens, okay? They produce a large amount of eggs from, those, from that farm. He informed me at the beginning of this month that the eggs would go from one quetzal to two quetzales. That's a 100% increase in the price of eggs, okay? So you can do the, the, the math there and see how many dollars that is. But the, ultimately, people that used to buy 50 eggs can only buy 25 because their amount of money is not increasing based on inflation. Their money, their, the amount of money they have is based on what they produce, not what they wish to produce or what they wish to buy, which is the main categorical, categorical difference between central banking uh, connected people to the people that have to work for their value extraction. So or the, or the currency that they extract from their value. And that, that's my main point is how can we destroy that perception of value? And that is with Bitcoin denomination. So abandoning the price of dollars for Bitcoin in exchange for the amount of Bitcoin you can earn in any given time. You decide what, what time that is. If, if you have thousands of Bitcoin, congratulations, you have a, a massive hedge in liquidity based on, on, on the value that you added and the time that you waited. And uh, if you don't have a, thousands of Bitcoin, you can hope that those people with a lot of Bitcoin are going to be using your products and services. And that's, I think, the critical the critical difference between other countries in El Salvador, the El Salvador figured out that if you invite liquidity in, they can benefit from that liquidity, okay? And they're not talking about dollar liquidity, they're talking about Bitcoin liquidity. And that's the, the, the categorical difference between other countries and the countries that are freaking out like the Netherlands, go ahead and freak out, okay? Because we figured out the game and the game is up, okay? There's no more game. If we denominate our value and trade in Bitcoin, there's nothing you can do. Exactly. You can't bar me from re receiving Bitcoin. You mm -hmm. can't stop me from receiving Bitcoin. You can't stop me from, you can criminalize me. But do you know how many people in the US consume drugs, even though they're highly illegal and are highly criminalized? Exactly, yeah. Well, I, I would say a large majority of people disobey and I have no problem disobeying unjust laws. No problem whatsoever. Zero, because it is not justice. Yeah, this is, this is what I always say, Dan, you know, yeah, because, you know, th there's a, where's, I always question, you know, the legitimacy. I mean, you can, you can produce all kinds of laws. You can, you know, uh, appoint yourself and declare yourself, you know, criminal immune, like the central bank does or Bank for International Settlement. The question I pose is like, where's the legitimacy? Like, do they, do they have a right to exist at all? I mean, you know, and, uh, and I think we need to, people need to wake up and, and ask these fundamental questions. Like, uh, you know, people, you know, they uh, they know, you know, the history of whatever Nazi regime or Stalinism or whatever. But uh, is I mean, are we obliged to obey? No, we're not obliged to obey. It's just the only thing they have is coercion, 
you know, oppression, violence, and aggression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. That's that's the main goal of. Oh, 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 sorry about that. Uh, no, that's the that's the main goal of 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 of, of having the ability to disobey peacefully. Because I don't want to take up arms against the ones that have monopoly on arms because that's exactly what they want and they'll squash it like a bug. So Bitcoin is peace, Bitcoin is hope. Whatever else comes from that, I guess we have to act upon ourselves to decide whether it's risky or not. But you know, I think it's worth the audience audience's input on, on whether a Bitcoin bond is viable or a volcano bond is viable. And we have to see what the actual results are based on, on the value that they're proposing to add with Bitcoin mining. So, and, and, and with that, you know, I guess we'll see what the future holds because at this point we have no other options. You know, there's, we can't just, you know, pretend like the U S dollar and every other fiat is okay. That's that, that perception of value is over in my mind, at least. And I know a lot of people are the same, which is why we, we obsessively trade dollars for sats, And we, we look at the sat per dollar price and or per part of the dollar per yeah, sat per dollar. So right now it's 2,600, I believe, 2,600 sats per dollar. So you know, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's mind boggling. So, um, so then um, what, 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 what is, what do you, how do you think this is going to play out? Because, you know, as, as some such as Max Kaiser or others said, if uh, if there's such a pressure on 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 El Salvador or you know any other country you know mm -hmm. in southern, w what do you think is a practical approach? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the Bitcoin community, but you know there's a lot of bunch of OGs you know who are sitting on thousands or ten thousands of, of of Bitcoin. I mean, do you think they're gonna, they're going to come to the rescue? And well, in my opinion, Max Kaiser and Stacy are two of the most productive people on the planet. Uh, uh, do you know, well, I'm sure you know, because we have a live show, but do you know what it takes? And I'm asking the audience what it, what it takes to wake up every day and deliver value through content consistently for a decade. Okay. And that's where, that's where I've found a lot of value and that value creation is what makes people productive and productive people have Bitcoin and productive people have to decide whether that Bitcoin is worth risking in productive pursuits. And I see it playing out as yes. People will, you know, somebody suggested uh, $10 bonds at 100, mi 100 million bonds for $10, which is 0.00297, I believe, uh, BTC. And we'll, we'll have to divide that into SATs because I, I don't have the denomination exactly, but uh, it, it's viable. If you want to buy 100 bonds, that's, you know, that's enough for a, for a thousand bucks. Do a, a lot of people have a thousand bucks on Bitcoin and they want to get a yield on that money without, you know, an enormous amount of risk and giving it to some random company or some random guy, I don't know. And I'm not asking for custody of your Bitcoin. I'm simply saying, let's make a vehicle so that somebody else can utilize that capital productively in productive pursuits so that, A, we see the flourishment of the Bitcoin economy and the what I call the rogue economy in, in, a, in a grand scale so that if there's a, a billion dollars worth of purchasing power being applied to a country Aside from, aside from it being a law, which I personally don't see huge value in because it requires permission to get a law passed and I'm not going to get a law passed in Guatemala anytime soon. So my advocacy has always been individuals taking the, taking the, the, the decision themselves to adopt uh, Bitcoin as, as a business model. And again, I'll, I'll try to show myself a little bit, bitcoinschool.com. That's my main, main focus is allowing understanding of business systems embedded into Bitcoin because it is so easy to do it. It is ridiculous how easy it is to build a Bitcoin business. And if we only had a small amount of people willing to utilize that as an actual value exchange, okay? If, if we actually had a, a, a large group of people buying and selling things on Bitcoin, that would drive adoption faster than any law in any country, in any, yes. any part of the world. It would simply... Yeah. It would simply be become a standard trading operandi. You, I see that happening yeah. in El Salvador. I mean, I'm maybe, maybe yeah. I'm too optimistic. I'm gonna see that. You know, I think it's it's going to to be really accelerated this process now. 
uh, you know, and and again, a big shout out to Jeff Booth because I think this will this will create you know a totally like you know it's he always says you know the inf, inf, the this uh, central bank inflationary policies and and you know this this uh, this manipulative uh, uh, monetary policies do they do they just don't match with the deflationary technologies. So eventually you know, we will go into this into this. Uh, into this process, you know, of, of deflationary economies where everything becomes cheaper and cheaper. And, you know, because yeah. of the division of labor and energy and resources, we're going to have much more efficient infrastructures also uh, being created in El Salvador and elsewhere. Yeah, I agree. And, and that I come back to my explanation originally is what, what, how much Bitcoin can you make in any given day? Okay, people in El Salvador versus the U.S. people, wide difference, okay? So there's an economic shift that's going to happen between people earning dollars versus people earning dollars in El Salvador or people earning catalysts here in Guatemala. There's going to be a, a deviation that rewards people that are highly productive, and that's my point exactly. If you believe that El Salvador can be highly productive with their geothermal mining and their, and their mining operations, you can allocate your capital without permission to fund that individually without laws. The fact that the state is involved has no relevant nature to how profitable they could be. It has no relevant nature to how much money you can make. It has no relevant nature to any of the choices that you have to analyze or the information you have to analyze an individual to make a choice of allocating capital. And it all comes back to, hey, taxation Without representation, fine. I see taxation as a as a as a state owned portion of my value production, regardless of what I get out of it. It is right. non proportional to the contributions that I have, and then not non proportional to the people that are super productive, more productive than I am. And there's no uh, there's no comparison to what I produce versus, for example, what somebody with a, a factory produces with 150 employees, you know what I mean? That there's, there's, no, uh, there's no comparison. So we have to attribute our value production to our own individual assets and our own individual worth and, and derive that with how much we can invest, how much we can allocate and, and what risks we want to take, right? So, Yeah. No, this is, was, was an excellent conversation, uh, Dan, uh, to wrap this up. I mean, I, I have so many questions right now, you know, even <laughs> on the, you know, the economical perspectives, because uh, yeah. I think, you know, this, you know, as we say, you know, people come in for the whatever for uh, wealth accumulation or, or investment or whatever, the money, but actually it's, 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 I mean, it's everything. Every, it will, it will touch and will, it will transform everything, you know, whether it be the yeah. military industrial complex, uh, you know, the centralized, uh, uh, you know, structures, all this shit that's going on with, uh, you know, the manipulative, whatever, you know, it's, okay. everything is going to, is going to be changed uh, through this, uh, you know, uh, through this, um, hard scarcest money has never, never been you know done before in human history. So uh, without uh, without uh, you know going into any other rabbit holes, Dan, uh, you want to like give my listeners any final thoughts or um, where people can find you? Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm at Dan Sanchez on Twitter. I run. I just started BitcoinSchool.com, and uh, I hope to be able to add value to each and every individual that wants to listen to the message of sound money. And that's really where I derive my, my value from is being able to show people that sound money isn't really uh, uh, um, a zero sum game, right? It's not a zero sum game because if you can creatively add value, which is in my mind, a human, a human ability to be endless, Okay, there you can you can have endless opportunities with your creativity and with your value addition. You can touch many, many people's hearts and minds with, with clear understanding of what value you're adding to them. And uh, if if Bitcoin helps us get there with programmatic truth, then I think we have the opportunity to change the world in ways that we are not going to see uh, realized in our lifetime. But maybe in a hundred years, when when people are 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 truly deriving. Uh, as much value as they're adding uh, to others voluntarily, then I think that's a that's a beautiful image in my mind where I can say, you know, there's no there's no plunder 
There's no feudalistic ideas of, of public ownership of my value. Uh, I, 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 you know, there's no words. If I could, if I could implement that in a microcosm of a hundred people, which I'm trying to do every day, uh, it is something I wake up to with a childlike sense of, of eager, eager pursuit. That's like, my kids are so young, you know, and they, they chase everything with such eagerness that I try to mimic that. And, and it, and it reflects on, on, on how aggressive I've, learned and i've dedicated my time to understanding what the heck is happening what is happening <laughs> because nobody understands nobody really like yeah. breaks it down for you and say what the heck is happening but max kaiser and, and stacy i see you my loves you guys have broken down for me and have helped me understand this mess of a system that has subjugated so many people and so many and so many lives uh and that you know that if i can help one zero one percent of of that in any sort of capacity, then I'll wake up every day and do it with as hard as I can. So yeah, that's, that's my message. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Let's go, man. Yeah. Max guys, yeah. they said, but they have really literally like transformed so many lives and elevated, yeah. you know, the, the knowledge and the consciousness of so many people. It's, it's amazing. I mean, you know, I mean, we were really in such an exciting point of time. Uh, so Dan, thank you so much again for joining me. I hope we can repeat this in the near future and you know maybe in a panel discussion. And uh, yeah, yeah uh, hope I'll, I'll try to do. I, <laughs> you know, I'll be honest. Um, yeah, it's actually uh, what time is? It? I can't see my. It's ten twenty one right now in the morning. Uh, I don't know what time it is there. I'm sure it's late, but uh, I'm gonna try to do a spaces. I just got on it yesterday yeah. thanks to an invitation from, that would be, from yeah. Ozzy and we listened to like three hours of, of the Lord, of, one of the Lords of the islands of Tonga. Yeah. And that was like, you know, game changing for me because I just always ignored that feature of Twitter and, and uh, clubhouse. And I think that that's going to allow our messages to be clearly heard and live without saying, Hey, this guy's, you know, BSing about whatever, or he's shilling shit coins. You know, I didn't mean to say the word, but, that's you know I, I don't i don't shit coin anybody and uh it's all bitcoin for me baby yeah because it's you know at the end of the day it's all about you know uh the ethos and the uh, ethical principles yeah, and the vision bitcoin. of bitcoin well dan thank you so much for joining me and uh i'll, I'll talk to you soon thanks you thank thanks you, dan. you i appreciate your time take care bye bye hey hope you enjoyed this episode my talk amazing talk with dan sanchez is really uh, you know great uh, soul and mind, and uh, I've really learned a lot from him today. And there's you know so much to undig and go deeper into the rabbit hole. I just wanted you know for for myself and for my listeners for you to give a little bit a bigger picture of what's going on, especially in connection with El Salvador and the opportunities, the potential, and you know and we're really at the at the cusp at the tipping point of human history and uh, we just need you know just a critical mass of whatever three four five percent of the earth's population a critical mass of countries coming together do you know enacting the same thing which which Elsa Elsa de Dor now is starting to, to do uh, but more or less in synchronicity this is my conviction and this is how we can make all these you know uh, this this oppressive coercive aggressive militarized institutions uh, whether it be government central banks nation states obsolete so hope you're gonna enjoy hope you know you really enjoyed this and let me know what you think let me know your questions please make sure you follow me you follow dan sanchez on twitter subscribe to my youtube channel my podcast platforms if you love this episode any other episode make sure you leave me a five-star review on apple Podcasts or itunes that would help me a lot and it would help you know increase the algorithm and so that people can find these educational materials. So uh, if you have any suggestions for future talks or panel discussions, just let me know. My email or DMs are open. You can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, uh, Telegram, uh, and what have you. So thank you so much again, and I'll talk to you soon.